What is it that distinguishes engineering from other disciplines? Day to day, what changes when you begin to learn to think like an engineer? Actually, I think that one of the pioneers of software engineering, in fact, the first software engineer, identified a key behavior that is central to an engineering approach, an engineering mindset even, software or not, something that all of us sometimes forget and shouldn't. The vital shift in focus from what happens when everything works as we expect to the engineering focus on what could possibly go wrong. And that's what I'd like to talk about today. Hi, I'm Dave Farley and welcome to my channel. If you haven't been here before, please do hit subscribe. And if you enjoy the content here today, hit like as well. The focus on what can go wrong is an idea that I think is deep at the heart of engineering thinking of all kinds. It's a mental tool, if you like, that we can all use to improve the things that we build and is in many ways so obvious that it's easy to forget and very easy to ignore. But it's absolutely at the heart of doing a good job in software or any other form of engineering. Margaret Hamilton, the woman who led the team that built the innovative, first-of-a-kind software for the flight control systems and inertial guidance systems for the Apollo program, and who invented the term software engineering, recognised it and called it out as one of the main changes in her team's thinking when they started thinking of what they did as engineering rather than just as craft or software development. What I'm referring to here is a focus on actively thinking in terms of what could possibly go wrong. Or to quote the Mythbusters, failure is always an option. At first sight, this may sound like a rather negative take on things, but it's a vital part of an engineering mindset. You may think that we would be better off focusing on the glorious outcome that we hope for when everything comes together and things work properly. And of course, we need to do that too. But an engineer knows that between now and that glorious outcome, there are lots and lots of things that can go wrong. This is more than an exercise in counting philosophical angels dancing on theoretical pinheads though. It's a practical, useful technique in developing better software systems and achieving better outcomes. If tasked with building a bridge, an engineer will imagine the bridge falling down if we load it too high, and maybe what would happen if the wind or an earthquake causes the bridge to wobble too much. When we start out as programmers though, we tend to focus on whatever the problem is that we are aiming to solve, and as soon as we've solved it, often we just stop at that point. But that isn't really enough to count as engineering. Many, many years ago, I used to work for a PC manufacturer. One day, one of my colleagues wrote a program, which I think he called A, which worked and did exactly what he wanted. But it wasn't a well-engineered piece of software. He left it on a floppy disk on the table next to his desk. Later, another colleague found the disk and put it into his computer and somewhat irresponsibly ran the program called A without imagining what could possibly go wrong. A was a simple program. It had no inputs, no visible outputs while running, but when you ran it, it searched your computer for all disk drives and then did a hard reset, a factory format of them all. Chaos ensued. So this is a silly story about doing silly things, but both of these people were being silly in this, in this story. Because although, ironically, both of their job titles included the word engineering, neither one was adopting an engineering mindset here. Perhaps things would have been better if the author had paused briefly and thought, what could go wrong here? This would surely have prompted him to think that it was possible that someone, however foolishly, might attempt to run this on a computer with disks that they didn't really want formatted. So although it would be a few moments of extra work for him, he could have averted the hours later spent trying to recover data from a previously formatted disk if he'd simply tried a few different things, maybe changing the name to something like Disk Zap, or, and perhaps adding a text banner to describe the risks, and then a conf confirmation check that, yes, you really did mean to zap the disks. 
before allowing the by definition destructive process to begin to do its work. Let's pause there and say thank you to our sponsors. We are fortunate to be sponsored by Equal Experts, Tricentis and Transfic. These are all companies that offer products and services that are very well aligned with the topics that we discuss on this channel every week. So if you're looking for excellence in continuous delivery and in software engineering, click on the links in the description below and do check them out. My point here is about something that I think goes a lot deeper than don't write destructive programs called A. Margaret Hamilton's point was that at every step in the design and development of the Apollo flight control systems, she and her team were thinking, how could this go wrong? And they then worked to build their systems in a way that either avoided the potential failures that they imagined, or if they couldn't do that, to fail in a way that was safe and ultimately, famously, this approach saved the first Apollo mission to land people on the moon. In this case, Margaret and her team thought about how their mission-critical software would respond when it became overwhelmed with work during critical phases of the flight. If they did nothing, the system would effectively grind to a halt under the load, which is not really what you want for a flight control system, which people's lives depend on. So without being asked, they built in some protections. Fail-safe mechanisms that would shed load when the system was under serious stress. The single core computer was tracking all sorts of parameters and performing all sorts of calculations, measuring height, speed, trajectories and position, as well as fuel burn, acceleration and so on. So they added in some internal monitoring and a fail-safe mechanism. When the computer ran out of capacity to cope, the 1201 and 1202 alarms were triggered. And in response, the computer did a soft reset, killing all of the jobs and restarting them all in order. Fast enough so that no navigation information was lost. This fail-safe mechanism meant that the flight control system could continue to operate correctly in real time, even though it was being interrupted by resets due to the overload. Clever. I don't think that anyone but an engineer would have thought about a problem like this in this way. I like the quote from computer scientist Tony Hoare. There is nothing a mere scientist can say that will stand against a flood of $100 million. But there is one quality that cannot be purchased in this way, and that is reliability. The price of reliability is the pursuit of the utmost simplicity. It is a price which the very rich find most hard to pay. It's not enough to only identify a problem and write a program called A. We also need to think of the ways that A can go wrong and then find ways to handle those difficult cases and stop things from going wrong to make it more reliable. Not only in terms of its internal functioning, though that's vitally important, but also how it exists in the world like making it a bit safer if someone happens across a disk that contains a copy of this obscure looking piece of code and then decides to run it. One thing that as engineers we can't assume is that people will always use the tools that we provide to them in the way that we expect them to be used. In another great story from Margaret Hamilton's life, she annoyed people at NASA immensely by pointing out repeatedly that the lunar module and the astronauts that were at serious risk because of the design of some software. She pointed out that when a system was in a particular mode, an astronaut had only to push a single button at the wrong time and it would disable the entire spacecraft, stranding astronauts on the moon and effectively killing them. NASA argued that astronauts were immensely smart, capable and well-trained people and would never push the wrong button at the wrong time. This was a crazy idea and not worth spending software development time on. Later on, on the Apollo 11 mission, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin did exactly that. They pressed the button. Fortunately, by that time, NASA had listened to Margaret and her team and had made the system fail-safe for this function. My point here is about something more important than building 1960s spaceships. It's about the engineering principles involved. We need to explicitly think about how things can go wrong and then think of ways to eliminate such failures and where we can't eliminate them altogether to find ways to make our systems fail safely. Margaret and her team at MIT were so good at this approach to engineering that during the entire Apollo program, 
not a single bug was found in any of the flight control systems. Practically, we are not all building what Margaret's team called man-rated systems, systems that would kill people if they went wrong. But some of us are, and many of us, if not most of us, are working on software that matters, even if it isn't capable of killing people. Thinking about how things may go wrong and actively exploring those unhappy paths is, to my mind, at the heart of a good engineering approach. Working hard to simplify things so that we reduce the corners in our software where nasty problems can hide is the difference, really, between good systems design and bad. This seemingly negative mindset is actually the opposite of that. This is at the core of good engineering. And it works at every level. When I write a function, what will happen if the parameters that are passed into it are wrong? Would my code be better if I checked the inputs before I acted on them? If part of my system fails, does everything fail together, or would it be better if I designed it to fail safely, offering a progressive degradation in service rather than a catastrophic halt? Maybe I could build my system so that each part was somewhat isolated from every other, so that some parts could carry on doing useful work while broken parts recovered. I'm pretty sure that that would be a better system than one that just crashed. We get much deeper insight into the systems that we build when we start to think about how things might go wrong and design those systems to either be resilient in the face of failure or defensive, preventing the failures that we think of from happening in the first place. This isn't something that we can rely on other groups of people to do for us. I think that this style of thinking is an important part of the value that we as software developers and engineers bring to the table. At least it is when we're doing a good job. This is also not about attempting to be perfect. We're always going to miss things. There will be cases that we don't think of and defences that don't work as we expected. Focusing on how things can go wrong also means that the empiricism of engineering is also deeply important too. As well as trying to predict how things might go wrong and mitigating their impact, we also need to be monitoring what really goes wrong to our systems in the real world and learning from those things. And then working to make sure that those things don't go wrong in the same way again. Engineering is not about perfection, it's about pragmatism. This may all sound rather obvious to you, but to be honest, I don't see many software projects where this style of thinking is actively promoted and encouraged. Most teams that I meet are usually under some stress to produce more and more features, which has a dangerous tendency to focus them primarily only on the happy paths, and so lead them to ignore the things that might go wrong resulting in much more fragile systems. Consciously adopting the engineering mindset and thinking about the ways in which things might go wrong will result in better, though probably not perfect, software, unless you're Margaret Hamilton, of course. Thank you very much for watching. If you enjoy our stuff here on the Continuous Delivery channel, please do consider supporting our work by joining our Patreon community. There's lots of benefits to that, including a very active Discord community. We hope you enjoy it. Thank you.